Hello, friends. Today we're taking a closer look at the fantastic philosopher called Numenius of Epamia. Epamia being in Syria, northern Syria, on the bank of the Orontes River. His many works, which include a work on space, on number, on the imperishability of the soul, on the inexpressibles in Plato, on the defection of the academy, and on the good are all unfortunately in tatters. The only way we have access to Numenius is through the quotation of other authors, in this case, mostly Christian authors, Origen, but especially Eusebius. So we have to be aware that the quotes that we have represent, in many cases, Christian concerns. And the Christians wanted to call upon Numenius as an intellectual ally for his apparently Trinitarian views, his views on miracle, and his views on the dissension within Greek philosophy. All this was useful for later Christians. But because the fragments are so relatively abundant and full, we can piece together more aspects of this thinker's thought. He has been viewed as incredibly important for the history of Gnostic Christian thought, for his differentiation between the high god called Father, or the one who is, and the Demiurge, or the creator god. He really of all the Middle Platonists, makes that distinction most clearly and strongly. We see that distinction also in the Hermetic Poimandres. We see it also in Alcinous. But Numenius really argued for it and argued strongly for it. He also has a book on the imperishability of the soul and a theory of Daimones, and he was an exegete, allegorical exegete of Homer. He was, by all accounts, an extremely fascinating figure and extremely influential in later philosophy for Plotinus and Plotinus's disciple Amelius. This is someone you will want to know. So Apamia is in northern Syria. It's south of Antioch, the capital at the time. But it a, was a very important city in antiquity. Another author calls Numenius a Roman, and it's difficult to know what to make of this. Possibly Numenius had a sojourn in Rome. We just don't know. But it appears that Apamia was the place of his birth. It was a special place. It was where he felt that he belonged and where he could teach philosophy. Numenius is often called a Pythagorean, and Justly so, because Pythagoras for Numenius was even more important than Plato and Socrates, and he viewed Plato and Socrates as both Pythagorean and learning and promoting Pythagorean doctrines, even if they did so just orally and in a kind of enigmatic way. Numenius was attractive to Christians in part because he was, unlike some Greeks, open to the wisdom of other nations like the Egyptians, the Magi, the Jews, the Chaldeans. Of course, he doesn't mention the Christians, but the Christians liked Numenius because he viewed the Jewish tradition as promoting an incorporeal god. Numenius also allegorized certain texts in Homer, such as the Cave of Nymphs, and he apparently tackled other texts in Plato, such as the myth of Ur, and he uh, was said to have an interest in occult or more hidden matters. Now, Numenius was famous for having a triadic, or if you will, Trinitarian theology. That might seem somewhat surprising to you because he's not Christian, never claims to be Christian. And although he may have known about Jesus, he doesn't name Jesus, he doesn't develop any Jesus tradition whatsoever. According to Proclus, the triad was made up of three beings, God, the maker, and the maid, and the, the maid being the world. 
like Plato, Numenius probably thought that our cosmic system was a god. On the other hand, many are convinced that Proclus is either simplifying or bending the truth, that Numenius's triadic theology is more binitarian. It involves a god, a called father and the good, or the one who is, and then a demiurgic figure or craftsman god who is the god organizing matter and is the god in charge of birth. And when this god contemplates the good, he is in one phase of his existence. And when he is focused on matter through a kind of appetite toward matter, he splits himself. And this split is never really defined well. Either the demiurge is simply in another phase when he is managing matter, or there really was some kind of ontological split and the demiurge has a lower manifestation as the manager of matter and a higher manifestation contemplating the good. We don't really have an absolutely clear statement on this controversy. On the topic of matter, Numenius believed that matter was eternal and coeval with God, but that it did not have being, which for him meant that it was fluid, boundless, and undefined. And this, for him, was what matter, what made matter the dyad. Whereas God is a monad with coherence, matter is a dyad. Matter represents difference and two-ness, and it has to be organized and crafted in order to take any sort of shape. Numenius was insistent that matter did not emerge from God, God either retracting him to himself or whatever. That would threaten for Numenius what we might call the sovereignty of God. It might threaten also the goodness of God. So he was happy to let matter just be a pre-existent amorphous stuff, a kind of sea or abyss that was just there and has always been there. This is why people typically call Numenius a dualist, because he has a strong view of God and then a strong view of matter as two independent principles. But I think the important thing to remember here is that God is being reality and matter really isn't real in that sense. So if we're going to call Numenius a dualist, we, I think, need to recognize that the kind of dualism he's working with overwhelmingly ascribes being and essence and reality only to one figure, and that is God, and that matter only takes on or participates in being by being organized and crafted by the demiurge. So that's look at some of the differences between God the Father and the demiurge craftsman creator God for Numenius. This becomes important for Lady Christian theology, which distinguishes the Father God from a Logos creator who is also identified with Christ. In the case of Numenius, God the Father and the creator are both minds. They're both noetic, made of noose. So we're not quite yet at Plotinus, where there is a, a one above noose. For Numenius, God the Father stands, Hestos, he is eternally permanent. The Demiurge is the God who moves and moves through the heavens. God, for Numenius, is the source of being, but the Demiurge is the source of birth and the one who watches over birth, the one who manages the birth of all creatures on earth and in the cosmos. God the Father is goodness itself. The Demiurge is only good by participation. And it's important to emphasize that he's good so that one doesn't make the mistake of thinking Numenius is a kind of Gnostic who believes in negative demiurgy, that is, the view that the creator is evil. No, the creator is definitely good, but he's good by participation. God is father, the demiurge is an imitator of God. And so you can kind of see how this mirrors later Christian theology 
Christians who interact with Numenius in the second century are writing a trend or representing a trend in which you can have a primary father deity and a logos or creator craftsman deity on a kind of second tier or second rung, and that is the deity who creates the cosmos. God uses the Demiurge as an instrument, but the Demiurge is different, and he is in the image of God and represents God on earth. Another interesting image that Numenius uses is he depicts God as a farmer and the demiurge or creator craftsman deity as a planter. And this is interesting because although the demiurge is the one working directly with matter, there is a kind of creative aspect to God the Father. God the Father is, as Numenius calls him, the one who is, and the one who is sows the seed of every soul. So the soul is sowed by the father deity, and it's the demiurge who plants the soul in individual human beings at birth. And that should remind you of certain features in Gnostic Christianity, as well as other all other sorts of Christianity where we have interesting ideas about God creating the soul and implanting it in human beings. And I think this also illustrates another point about Numenius. Although his vocabulary is sometimes difficult, he had a kind of poetic soul to him that he used very vibrant images. And this is one of those vibrant images which he used to illustrate his philosophy. According to Porphyry, Numenius thought that people had two souls but probably what this means is that people had two kinds of souls, namely rational and non-rational. Non-rational souls also being in animals. And he might even have hypothesized that there were vegetable souls. We don't really know. But the rational soul is a deathless intellect. This is the part that comes from God and is integrated into the human being. This is the part that comes down through the gates of the sun, through the gate of cancer, and then when at the end of a human's life, if that human has been upright and has learned philosophy, that soul will rise back to God through the gate of Capricorn. Where you can see Numenius at his best in terms of literarily is in his work on the divergence of the academics from Plato. This is a very fun, highly polemical attack on Arcesilaus and Carneades, who were heads of the Platonic Academy in the Hellenistic period. And where these figures went wrong, according to Numenius, is that they transformed Plato's Academy into a kind of new or newfangled, in his opinion, skepticism that had more to do with Pyrrho than with Plato. It's a good read. Now, the connection to Gnosticism, and you can see this emphasized in the work of John Dillon, is important to note. Uh, by Gnosticism here, I mean Christian movement uh, that believed in the separateness of the Creator from the Father and either thought of as the Creator as a neutral figure or as an evil figure. It's interesting that for Numenius, the creator, though, is definitely not evil. Evil for Numenius comes from matter. Not that matter itself is evil, but it is the cause of evils. Embodiment for Numenius was always an evil because it meant that the soul whose true ecology and true home was in the noetic sphere apart from matter is imprisoned in a platform which isn't the ideal platform. It's, it doesn't allow the human soul to be free. So yes, embodiment is an, is an evil. One could think of that as a Gnostic trait, but in fact, that's really a much more just generally Platonist trait. And Numenius's idea, of course, that the high god or father is not the craftsman of the world 
it's not specific to the Gnostics. That's something that a Platonist could believe. And as I mentioned before, we have Alcinous also apparently vouching for this position about the mid-2nd century, as well as the Hermetic Tractate Poimandres. This is just another live option, another way of interpreting Plato's Timaeus. And it's also an option that many Christians took, whether they viewed the creator as the Logos Christ, or whether they viewed the creator as the Judean Lord, whom the Greeks called Yao. That was a live option for them. And yes, this is a similarity that Numenius has with so-called Gnostic Christians, but it's also a similarity he has with Christians that have been called proto-Orthodox. So this is a, a larger conversation, and we can do more sophisticated and broader comparisons with Numenius. Now, as I said at the beginning, we don't have Numenius's works themselves. Numenius comes to us as a quoted author. So it's important to understand who is doing the quoting. And so we have Origen, lots of quotes in the Contra Celsum. It's Porphyry who tells us that Origen used Numenius. He read him well. He had his books. And so it's no surprise that Origen, his intellectual heir, Eusebius, also had books of Numenius. And Eusebius gave very generous quotes from Numenius's book on the good and also on the dissonance between the academics and Plato. Among later Neoplatonists, we have Porphyry and Proclus also quoting from Numenius. In many cases, though, their quotes aren't very precise and they're a bit more paraphrastic. Uh, and we also have important material from Chalcidius. So it's important to know these names um, so that one gets a sense of you know, who is trustworthy, who is actually quoting, who's paraphrasing. And in the next slide, I'll tell you where you can get a translation of these quotes from Numenius. So the best translation of Numenius today in English is that by Robert Petty, Fragments of Numenius of Epamia, and he will also give you a commentary on those fragments. It's a This is the work you want to get. I, I don't recommend sur surfing the internet and trying to get a translation of Numenius's fragments. I would just go to Petty. If you're looking for a basic introduction, we have John Dillon's great work called The Middle Platonists. Um, and I give you the page references here. And a bit more recently, Mark Edwards on Numenius in the Cambridge History of Philosophy and Late Antiquity. These will give you a, a basic introduction. There's also the Stanford Encyclopedia online, which you can just run a search for on Google and look for Numenius there. That will be a reliable source. Just make sure you're you're getting those reliable scholarly sources on Numenius because this is a, it's a tricky kind of a subject because we're dealing with fragments. And so be aware that you know in, interpretations will differ on Numenius because we've only got the works and fragments. Thanks so much for coming along. I hope you will leave a comment and a like if this has benefited you in any way. I'd like to know how I can be of better service to you and answer your questions. For all those questions, I'll take them uh, over Patreon. So come join me there and consider supporting me as I bring this material and make it freely available online. I really appreciate your support. Thank you so much and take care.